Hey everyone, and welcome back, or for the first time, to Explore Your Roots. This is the Who Is series where we talk about and highlight an ancestor of mine and maybe yours. And on this episode, we are going to be talking about a Peter Jorgen Christian Jacobson. Peter Jorgen was a man of many trades, an immigrant, a musician, a businessman, a store owner, a community leader, and much more. So tune in to learn more about his life and the legacy he left. Okay, so to preface this story, I have heard a lot about Peter Jorgen, sometimes referred to as PJ. Growing up, I remember hearing stories from my dad, and so a lot of my information comes from written accounts that my dad has, as well as other information from genealogy websites and a great biography posted by my dad's cousin Claire on her website, and I'll leave a link to that in the description. Additionally, I found a handful of articles online, a book, and a virtual town tour all mentioning Peter Jorgen, all of which will be linked in the description. So to begin, Peter Jorgen Christian Jacobson is my third great-grandfather on my dad's side of the family, so my connection to him begins with me, then goes through my dad, then his mom, Ruth Ann, then her mother, Genevieve, then her father, Frederick, then his father is the topic of this episode, Peter Jorgen Christian Jacobson. Peter Jorgen, later in life affectionately, received the nickname PJ. This name stuck, and he often used it when referring to himself, so from here on I will refer to Peter Jorgen as PJ. Our story begins on April 26, 1846, near Frederikshavn, Denmark. Here, Peter Jorgen Christian Jacobson was born, the first of nine children born to Frederick Jacobson and Elizabeth Peterson. As is normal, yet unfortunate, not much is known about PJ's youth. There are, however, a few things we can pick on and infer from his youth in Denmark. We know that Denmark had an established religion, which was the Lutheran Church. Most scholars say that to be Lutheran and Danish was pretty much the same thing. That all changed, however, with the establishment of the Constitutional Act of Denmark in 1849, which established a religious freedom in Denmark. Most of Danish society did not expect people to leave the Lutheran Church, but in reality people left in troves for other religions. This new sense of religious freedom got to PJ and his parents and family, and sometime, probably in the late 1850s or 1860s, Frederick Jacobson left the Lutheran Church and took his family with him. PJ would have been a young kid, probably around 8 to 13 or 14 years old. In a biography written about Frederick, PJ's father, it says that many of Frederick's friends and family became unfriendly towards their family because they had left the Lutheran faith, perhaps because of being ostracized a bit and also probably because they longed to be with the rest of their religious congregation, Frederick decided to take his family and emigrate to the United States. So he took his family, which at this time was he and his wife, their children, PJ and four other siblings and they all traveled south to Hamburg, Germany. And on April 15, 1862, they boarded the ship called Franklin and set sail for Castle Garden, New York, the first American immigration station with a passenger load total of 413 people. Ship conditions were not too bad. Below the deck, there were 160 bunks wide enough for three people each. They had rations of a lot of food, some of which included beef, pork, peas, beans, potatoes, rice, and much more. The people occupied themselves with music, dancing, and prayer. Unfortunately, while on board, measles broke out and spread like wildfire among the people. Many of the passengers, mostly children, came down with the illness. The passengers and crews took to sanitizing the ship two or three times a week and fumigating by burning tar, but unfortunately, in the end, 48 people total had died, which is more than 10% of the people on the ship. Among these people were three of the four siblings that came with PJ, and his last surviving sibling on board passed away shortly after arriving to New York. It must have been a very sobering feeling and atmosphere for PJ and his parents. Once they arrived to New York, they were all quarantined and some people were sent to the hospital. They stayed on the ship for a few days, and then on May 31st, 1862, they were able to go through the immigration process at Castle Garden. It was here at Castle Garden 
that PJ's last name was made official. Danish tradition holds that surnames come from your parents. For example, since PJ's father's name is Frederick, tradition holds that Peter's last name should actually be Frederick's son. But in passing through Castle Garden, their names were finalized, taking on the surname of the family patriarch, Frederick, and all becoming Jacobsons. Their travels were, however, not over, as they decided to be with the rest of their friends and congregation out west in Utah. So they continued their journey, finally landing in a town called Little Copenhagen, which later was changed to Mantua, which is near Brigham City, Utah. A few weeks later, PJ's sister was born, which brought joy and new life into their home. After living in the United States for a few years, PJ and the rest of their family probably began to feel a bit more assimilated to life out west. Also probably around this time, maybe 1866 or 1867, PJ met his future wife, Nicolina Thompson, also a Danish immigrant born not far from where Peter was born. They fell in love and were married on March 22, 1867. Together, they had eight children, all of which lived to adulthood. George was the first, born in 1868, followed by Eliza in 1870. Then Sarah was born next in 1872, and Anthon was in 1874. Ira was born in 1877, and Martin in 1879. Lena was born in 1881, and the last child, Frederick, of whom I come through, was born in 1884. Shortly after their marriage in 1870, PJ took his wife and followed his parents and moved up to Bear Lake, Idaho. Up there, they took up farming and milling, of which PJ was much involved. While in Bear Lake, PJ organized a pioneer band, and it is said that PJ learned to play the fife, flute, violin, and French horn, but in the band he played the fife, which is kind of like a flute. It is unknown where or when he learned to play, but he enjoyed very much music and continued with it the rest of his life. In 1883, a group of people were heading down to the Gila Valley, Arizona, and PJ decided to go with his wife and seven children. Along the way, they stopped in Luna Valley, New Mexico, because their six-year-old son Ira was having problems with his hip, so they decided to stay for a time. It was there that my ancestor Frederick was born. In Luna Valley, PJ set up a sawmill, but unfortunately that venture was unsuccessful and short-lived. In 1885, PJ's wife Nicolina passed away at a young age of 39, leaving her husband to care for the eight children, one of which was still an infant. That same year, PJ took his children and continued the aforementioned journey on to the Gila Valley in Arizona. It is not exactly no when, but we do know that it is around this time when they moved to Arizona that Peter Jorgen received his nickname PJ, which stuck. Upon arriving in the Gila Valley, PJ purchased a farm in Safford, Arizona. Two years later, in 1887, he opened up a small general store that actually far outpaced all expectations. In order to meet growing demand, PJ built a larger building in 1895 to accommodate a large inventory of goods, and this building actually happened to be the largest building in Safford. It was a two-story building on the corner of 8th Street and 8th Avenue. The main floor of the building was for general merchandise and where all the goods were located for purchasing, and the second floor of the building was used as a community center, where a lot of dances, parties, weddings, church gatherings, and political meetings were held. This two-story building became a focal point of Safford's downtown. In this store, PJ had a large knife for cutting cheese. This knife has survived today, and for those who are only listening to this episode, it is a longer knife about 16 inches in length and is still in great condition today. Also from this store is a neat letterhead that my dad has. On this piece of paper, we learn that the general store PJ ran was called the Old Reliable Store. Also on that letterhead, we learn of some of the goods he sold there, including dry goods, groceries, harness goods, hardware, boots and shoes, farming machinery, and he even gave out loans on small interest. The handwriting we see on this letterhead is actually PJ's himself, as he wrote down the names of his children. While in Safford, PJ, with his love of music, helped organize a pioneer band of Graham County, which was comprised of five people. PJ, of course, played the fife, and there is a really neat picture of the band of five together. In 1886, PJ was married to an Abigail Fowler, and together they had four children. 
Emma, born in 1892, Abigail in 1896, Peter in 1900, and Clarence in 1906. Around 1894, PJ decided to further his business and opened up a sawmill determined to have it be more successful than the last he opened in New Mexico. And indeed it was. The sawmill was located in the Graham Mountains and was a hard task to build. PJ and company had to cut brush and blast rocks to make a road up the mountain, as well as haul heavy machinery up the steep incline. He was determined to have it finished, and so in 1895 the mill began operating. The processed timber at this mill provided for countless homes in the surrounding Safford and Thatcher towns. PJ, being a very successful businessman, also owned many properties, lots, and dwellings all along the Gila Valley, giving some away to his children for farming. Biographical Arizona published a biography of PJ in 1901 and said it is doubtful if any man in the vicinity is built more extensively or has more materially aided in the development of Safford. In 1899, Peter handed over much of the daily operations of the mill to his son George while he continued to run the store. Additionally, PJ continued his business ventures and bought a large piece of land on the edge of town where he built a brick kiln, thereby getting into the business of brick manufacturing. He may have sold these bricks in his general store. In 1915, PJ's second wife, Abigail, passed away. At this time, PJ was 69 years old. About a year later, in 1916, PJ got married again to an Elzina Allred. Now at this point, Elzina had been divorced from her ex-husband for a few years and was living in Safford. In 1927, after being married to PJ for 11 years, Elzina's ex-husband found out that he had liver cancer and asked her to remarry him and take care of him. So, Elzina and PJ divorced, and four days later, Elzina was remarried to her ex-husband. In the beginning months of 1929, and perhaps the latter months of 1928, PJ's health began to decline. He was 83 years old at the time, and was bedridden where he silently passed away on February 17, 1929. PJ, in his obituary, is referred to as being one of the old pioneer residents, meaning someone of stature, who had grit and left a profound and lasting legacy. He is one of the early residents who built businesses in the community that helped make the community better. It says that many people attended his funeral and gravesite services. What a great man PJ was. I've grown up hearing neat stories about him, and his legacy is noticeable in all those who have heard it. I'm very grateful for his example of ingenuity and grit, especially in his personal life, where he wasn't afraid to learn and grow. He cared for his family and was undoubtedly a musical man, having a love for those kinds of arts. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and I again encourage you all to investigate your own family history and to share the cool things you find. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to us here on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, as well as checking out our new website, exploreyourroots.org, where we post cool side stories and history, and follow our social media accounts.